be red light, warning light on. You get the disco dead. lights come on it. <laughs> well, it didn't, they did, it didn't light up like a Christmas tree. That was right. the subtle thing about it. Okay. it. It went from red light to no longer moving <laughs> in 40 minutes. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's, uh, that's probably finished that then. So we're sponsored by Volvo today then, really, aren't we? Well, we, uh, yes. We're saved by yes. Volvo, yes. shall we say. Yeah, thank you to Claire for lending me her car. Um, yeah, very would, much so. Would you buy a Volvo now? currently looking for one actually right, okay. because I've, yeah but uh, it's the i'm looking at the four before version because i need something to get a, a wire fan and kayak in the back of it plus four dogs right. plus a tent plus two kids wow um that has got some chance of going across a bit of a slippy field so yeah an xc70 uh all-wheel drive is uh if anybody's got on one going menu. yeah if just anyone's got get one in going, contact yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well that's that's the plan anyway just something practical i don't i really don't really do flash cars no. um no so and I, I see your Land Rover outside. I used to have a ninety, um, yeah. and it's it's a it's an acquired taste, isn't it? I mean, you, there's a certain there's a certain there, sort of, there are rules when it comes to driving a, a ninety. You have to stick your finger up to other nineties when you, you do pass indeed. one. Yes, um, that doesn't happen in a Hilux. You no. don't get that in a Hilux. <laughs> um, and so, Volvo's uh, drivers are usually asleep, aren't they? Most they of them. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're we're thinking about middle age and yeah. you know in, impending pensions. The big pensions. jumper gets in the way. You exactly. Can't see them, yeah. yeah. Or the bifocals. Yeah. But I'm content with my. 44 going on 75. I don't know why I like Land Rovers so much. I can barely fit in them. Oh, uh, the it's steering a, it's an appalling cocked. driving experience, it, it, it but really that's part is. of the charm. Yeah, it's <laughs> the pain for looking sort of good, I think. Yeah, I, mean, the, you, you, I don't know who <clears> puts <throat> up with it. I mean, if you're over six foot, you end up a, a journey with your lumbar vertebra screaming at you. You're yes. half deaf because of the engine noise. Yes. Um, my particular one, which I had, you know, it was, a, it was an old chassis that I had rebuilt by a friend of mine who specialises in it, Yeah. Um, had a party trick of when you went through a reasonably sized puddle a jet of water shot out of the handbrake housing and hit you in the left ear <laughs> <laughs> yeah. somebody once said that a land wading is, warning yeah, uh, system <laughs> it's uh, any any 90 of any vintage the cool ones you know yeah. they're, they're more of a collection of bolts moving in close formation than an actual car so yeah yeah, yeah. Well, you say where you live, everything's 40 minutes away. For yeah. me, everything's 10 minutes away. So a Land Rover's perfect. Yeah. Anything beyond 10 minutes, it becomes painful. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it does. <laughs> yeah, it's true if you're over a certain size. So uh, head of operations yeah. for Holtz. That's right. That yes. sounds really interesting. Yeah, it's it's a sort of a catch-all. We don't really do titles at Holtz, to be honest with you, no. but I've got to have something to put on the business card. So I've met know. Nick before, Yeah, uh, many years ago. Really nice guy. Yeah. Yeah. What a fabulous idea. Yeah, no, he's done. Now it's he's totally flourishing. Yeah, he's built that from scratch mm. um, over the last, oh, however long it is, nearly 30 years, I would have thought. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he's hired some exceptionally good, talented people who are some of the best at what they do. Mm. Um, and they are a great bunch. Yeah, mm. really good guys to work with alongside. And, and do you have an issue with sourcing? Is there, or does there seem to be a plethora of old guns that are rotating uh, that come to you? And... Not until COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I think that stopped most things, didn't it? Uh, yeah, but, well, we, mm. have a, we have a network of agents around the country and around the world yeah. um, who are constantly on the lookout for us. Um, and they are, we are in touch with them. I run the UK agents um, and uh, Rory runs the uh, overseas agents because yeah. he does our international shipping. Um, and we try and draw interesting items from all over the world. But we will, you know, you can't turn away the stuff that's at the cheaper end of the market no. and just say, oh, no, we're only going to have your Holland. We don't really want your single barrel BSA or your, you know, yeah. your bike hall, yeah. because that's not giving a proper service to the client. Sure. So we we take the good stuff, of course, and we put that in our main sale mm. um, and all the, the lesser value items, sort of £500 and under, yeah. you, traditionally, yeah. goes towards a sealed bid sale, okay. uh, which has grown and grown in popularity and it is a real bargain trove and lots of people love shopping in it because... And are the purchases largely UK or do you export guns as well? No, international, all right. over. Australia is currently very big for us. Okay. Um, America is, but it's it, shipping internationally to the States is harder than most people imagine. Most people think, oh, you know, Second Amendment, American gun laws, oh, yeah. you can get anything you want into the country. That's not sure. true. Right. Um, it, they're very, ATF are very specific in what they need to see uh, to import a, a firearm into the continental US. So mm. that's not as straightforward. Uh, obviously, Brexit's had an effect on exporting to Europe. Sure. Um, but we just have to, everyone's in the same boat on that one. We have to play their bowling as it comes down the pitch. Yeah. So um, we're all trying to find our way over the next six, eight months into the rules. So has Holt's been able to operate, and forgive my ignorance, throughout the lockdown, are you doing, you know, sort of online yeah, we, setups? And, and, we and took a, Nick <clears throat> uh, came to me and said, look, 
I want to move out of London. We know we don't need to be spending the money we're spending moving Because it was Knightsbridge, wasn't it? Suppose. It was. Well, yeah. we had various different Sarah rooms. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I've worked for Holtz 20 years ago. I've been back another two since la for the last two years. Yeah. Um, so we've had various different Sarah rooms over that time and the time that I wasn't there and doing other things. Um, but that's – we needed to, – to run a, an auction in London, you need a secure sale room, which tends to be traditionally a military barracks of some kind, usually TA barracks, yeah. because they're used to firearms in central London. They have all the security yes. that you need to see, and we had our own security as well, obviously, and everyone was signing in and everything, CCTV and all the rest of it, mm. um, so people could handle the guns freely. Yeah. Um, but actually, it was phenomenally expensive to do it. Mm. Um, and, you know – Nick is always looking at the way the business runs, how it can run smoothly, how it can prepare itself for the future. So, and quite rightly, obviously, he's been looking to to move it towards a more internet-based business. Um, and he came to me and he said, right, we're moving out of London. I need you to make this happen. Um, so all, all of a sudden, we've got to... <laughs> Rejig. How many guns? <laughs> well, this isn't the, 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 part of the problem is shifting, you know. How many do you have at any one time collectively or, you know, at once? It can vary. We shift 12,000 a year. Really? There or thereabouts. Wow. Um, but what That's it meant, moving out of London, moving to Norfolk, and it meant rejigging the whole of our premises in Norfolk to be able to, we had to move photography into a smaller area so we could build a specific showroom for the guns that yeah. are on auction in the main sale Yeah. Um, that used to be photography. That meant trying to you know, get the staff to see where we were going, bring them along with it, not because I we had to scale down some people's offices and that isn't always that hugely popular. <laughs> no. uh, and some people have a specific <clears throat> needs for room for the what they do. You know, yes. you have to have a, a, a proper focal length to get a decent picture of a, which is something that Andrew made very clear to me. So sure. we had to work around that. Um, and we had to, yeah, we had to rejig and re do the jigsaw, mm. if you like, mm. um, to get ourselves in a position to run four auctions a year from a Norfolk base yes. with slightly iffy internet near a marsh <laughs> in West 40 Norfolk. 40 minutes from somewhere. 40 minutes from everywhere. <laughs> um, and broadcast it live over the internet to the entire world. Yeah. Yeah, incredible. Make it, make it happen. Yeah, and you made it happen. <laughs> well, we did, yeah. I mean, it was a collective effort, of course. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's 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 overseeing that and making sure that those plans can be put in place and that everybody has what they need to be able to do it properly and that any problems that we face, and we did face quite a few, we ironed out. I mean, you, you, you're, you're, you know, hugely sort of insightful uh, and obviously you know your job inside out. Is it uh, part of just being professional or do you actually have a passion and an interest in old guns. Well, I hope it's both. Right, um, okay. I mean, I've always, always had a, a passion in old guns. I mean, it's... What's the draw to old guns? I mean, I know there's the obvious, but I mean, for you, you know, because you are clearly... For me, a lot of people that have old guns, they have their, you know, 686 yep. clay buster and something else for the field, and then they buy a black powder, you know, a muzzle yeah. loader or, a, uh, you know, yeah. some old double-triggered something. It's it's tangible history. Right. It's, you're, you're, when you're handling a particularly something from pre-First World War, you know, a, a Stephen Grant sidelock made in 1910. Beautiful. That is a stunning piece of handmade engineering shotgun that is just, it's made by bench-trained craftsmen who've done seven-year apprenticeships yeah. and poured their heart and soul into building the best gun possible, not down to a price, but up to a level. Yes, to As a somebody, standard. I'm yeah. quoting somebody, that I can't remember who said that, but I think yeah. this, uh, one, of the, one of the gun makers on Facebook said it. And that, yeah. I think that actually sums it up. It's not down to a price, it's up to a level, and they, don't, they didn't compromise. And those things are still in operation today and, and still perfectly usable. Mm. And the handling is like nothing else because the, the distribution of weight mm. over the entire gun mm. is superb. Yeah. And you can't get it just by putting balancing weights into stocks. Even and, with muzzle flip with modern cartridges? Well, it's, there, are, well, there are different styles of guns, yes. I mean, if you use a, a high-pressure you know, 32 gram load through a lightweight English cyber side yeah, is going to jump. It's going to dance, yeah. Um, and it's not going to be hugely fun to shoot. So you have to find, but you know, it's interesting how ounce load fives, ounce load sixes, or specifically the ones that I favour, the, the the continental shot sizes, yeah. ounce load sixes actually are five and a half. Yeah. Fantastic cartridge to use. Mm. Fantastic cartridge to use mm. um, out of a cyber side. Yeah. So, but then, you know, these are all the old rules of lead and we're moving away from the That's old it. rules yes. of lead and we, yes. we're now entering new Discussion territory. Discussion for another with, day. Absolutely, yeah, big topic, <laughs> big topic. Um, so, yeah, it's, yes, they are eminently usable, but, but yeah. what draws me to them is when you pick one up, you can, you can feel the quality. 
Yeah. As if you handle enough guns, you know when you pick something up and you can – the quality just sings. It, it just pours out of the gun in the yeah. way it handles, the way it closes, the sound it makes. Yeah. And there are some guns you close where there's that horrible ding yes. as the top lever comes across. Yes. That doesn't happen on an English side no. lock. In, an English side lock properly, when it's not loose and when it's properly jointed – Closes like a bank vault door mm. with certainty, mm. solid, you know, a yes. real solid sound. Yeah. And yet it handles like a wand. Mm. Now that that kind of, that level of engineering, that level of, of gun making is difficult to find yes. elsewhere. Yes. Uh, and that's what draws me to them, it always has. Um, I mean, I, I, I shoot over and unders, I own over and unders, I shoot semi-autos and enjoy yeah. them, but they're specific tools for a job. Um, I don't. I tend not to get sentimental about my over and under in my semi-auto because you know, it, especially with a semi-auto, it's pressure yeah. washing the mud off it at the end of the day. So yeah, you clean those with a cartridge. Well, it's quite good. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but it's it's but it's interesting, isn't it? It's almost like a a feel. Yeah. It's almost, you know, I, I, it sounds ridiculous. I'm going to say a spiritual thing, but it's almost like a feeling. You, you're considering who's made it, how it, yeah. it was made. It's like it's almost like an experience rather yeah. than just picking up, you know, uh, a, a sort of a machine made, you know, top notch, modern, over and under, which, you know, by its own rights is a precision tool because yeah, of what it absolutely, does. Absolutely. Yeah. But uh, it sort of almost feels soulless in comparison. It does. Yeah. Because th there, is, there is something intangible th that is very difficult to put your finger on about the soul of a shotgun. And it, again, it just, we're starting to get a little bit ethereal here. But yeah, yeah. but I had this conversation with Chris Beaumont, our senior cataloger, who's, who's yes. a, a very old friend of mine and, and what he's forgotten about English shotguns, most people will never know, to be honest yeah. with you. He's huge experience. And I just, I suddenly clocked the, a Wesley Richards that was in my hand. There's a little nubbin on the muzzle, on the bottom rib at the very tip of the muzzle. And I suddenly realized what it was. And it, and it, my, one of my hammer guns has heel and toe plates on the stock. Yeah. Now, though the heel and toe plates are a throwback to the muzzle loading days yes. where you would put the, the gun stock down on the ground and it would protect the stock from I like, marking. I like the look of those. Yeah. yeah. They, are a, they are a nod. from they were, They're completely redundant in the age of a breech loader, but they're yeah. a nod to the gun makers of old who trained the gun makers who made those advances through gun making to breech loading to, from hammers to hammerless to ejectors. That little nubbin on the muzzle of a Wesley Riches on the on the bottom rib at the front, mm. that is a ramrod stop. That again is a little nod to the gun makers of old. And I yes. find those bits absolutely fascinating. Yes. They are they're they are specialists at what they do, just smiling at their forebears. Yeah. And I think that's great. <laughs> it is. That it's, is what I like about vintage fabulous. guns. I think it's very interesting because you come across beautifully, by the way, but you are incredibly, as I've sort of read your articles, you know, had a look into the website. You're actually very precise, uh, indeed, in fact. I hope so. But very precise. No, and, and, and this is, <laughs> you know, this is positive. Yeah. Very precise in what you do and how you sort of put information across. And I find that a very interesting mix with then the sort of, spiritual link to yeah you know that the, the the ownership of a gun and indeed what we want to get on to yeah. shortly is your sort of idea behind uh you know coaching and the sort of zen like yeah. state yeah um an interesting mix i also know that as you, you you've told me in the past that you've got a uh, and a very sort of uh, uh, an incredible uh, family history uh, with the, relating to the military. Yeah. And we're not just talking catering call here. No. We're talking top end. Um, do you think that uh, sort of in your blood has led you towards guns? I know you're not military, but do you think there's an, 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 or is it just a coincidence? I, I think it's a coincidence. I think my... Did you want the fun of guns without being told what to do? Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't really do discipline. I have too, too much of a free-reeling free brain. We've I'm got a lot in common, actually. <laughs> Simon, good-looking, <laughs> smart hair. I, so much. <laughs> yeah, that's a lockdown haircut for you, but I did manage to get it in order. Oh, I was feeling quite good at it. <laughs> but uh, no, mm. I... Uh, yeah, I my my passion for shooting actually comes from from my father. Right. Um, you know, he when he left the army uh, in the seventies, and he was an army medic, um, and he moved. We moved back to the UK, uh, brief time in Essex, and then up to Norfolk, where he took a job uh, as a GP. Because just for clarity, obviously, yeah. the surname Reinhold yes. is German. Uh, it's it's sort so, of Danish German. Yeah, we Danish, yeah. we emigrated from Schleswig Holstein in the seventeen somethings. Yeah. I think, um, yeah. not too clear when we pitched up in this country to torture everybody with our <laughs> opinions, but um, yeah, some, something along those yes. lines. So uh, yeah, so he, he left the army um, and took a job as a GP in Norfolk. And I mean, he'd, he'd shot 
you know, he'd shot game while he was in the army occasionally. Mm. Um, but he started getting invited by his, his farming patients um, who would say, you know, come on, doc, let's get you in a line. Yeah. Um, and then it, it became a passion for him. Um, and I, so much so that I used to joke with him that um, if his patients wanted to see him during the season, that they would probably have to go beating. Um, <laughs> and he snapped back straight away. Credit to the old boy. He snapped back straight away. Well, if they're actually going beating, then they're probably fit as fleas and don't need to see that, There you go, yeah. <laughs> Litmus test, yeah. Yeah, that's what keeps... That's what, and actually, the serious point behind that is that, you know, when you're over 60, over 65, and you're retired back in the, you know, 70s and 80s, their social life revolved around, you know, it's win it's extra income for them, it's exercise for them, and it's actually a social connectivity, which yeah. we are really missing now and is, is now big news in the age of COVID. Do you know what? A mini digression, I and you'll laugh, I had a chap pick up one of our Land Rovers the other day on his recovery truck, mm. although it's actually being restored oh, and okay. repaired. The get-out clause there. <laughs> um, the guy was 80, yeah. 80 years old, you know, thin, nimble, wiry, and uh, and he said, you know, a lot of my friends and, and colleagues you know retired around sort of 65 67 mm. and he said most of them are now dead because mm. they took to the armchair mm. and they don't stay active and they don't get out and you know this guy was as fit as a fiddle but yeah. he said i drive this lorry i get out i walk he does shoot actually a yeah. little bit and um, he tinkers with old cars and he said you've got to stay busy to stay yeah. alive they're walking they're walking 10 12k a day yeah um, their heart rate is, is you know their, their heart yeah performance is good um, but it, it is that social connectivity as well. And if, you know, if old Bill doesn't turn up of a mm. day and he's mm. supposed to be there, mm. somebody's going, where's old Bill? Yes. We haven't seen him. Yeah, quite. So they're going to check on him. Mm. And it's that kind of, when you're in a rural community, that matters to mm. a lot of these, you know, these people I've grown up with um, I, working on the farm as well. I mean, we used to pull weeds out of sugar beet as a sort of teenage job. Mm. And there were, there were a bunch of snotty teenagers to, together with a whole load of old retired old boys <laughs> who, who were trying to keep us under control, <laughs> yeah. basically. Um, but, you know, they are they were fit. You know, I was working with guys pulling weeds out of sugar beet in 32 degree temperatures and they yeah. were 82. Yeah, conditioned, yeah. you see, ingrained, isn't it? Old Tom it? Brunton, used to just he used to rogue sugar beet in size 14 wellies, despite the fact he had size 10 feet. <laughs> <laughs> Every day, he wore the same Room thing. Room for expansion. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, and he went on for a long old while after that. Really? Yeah. So what took you from, because clearly you are, you know, man of the field. Mm. You like your pigeon shooting. Yeah. You like your game shooting. Yeah. Um, your hunting. Um, clays? Yes, came to it later. Yeah. Um, and I used to get I used to get drafted into the, the dad is a GP. They used to be a GP's consultants clay shoot at Mid Norfolk Shooting School every year. Yeah. Uh, and I get drafted in as a ringer. So to I bet shoot there was for a little GPs. side by side championship. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I I, <laughs> I I I basically I started competing with because there were, I didn't have a huge amount of confidence. Funnily enough, you know, mm. sort of in that in that era. And in sorry, as a person as a, or of, within a, shooting, both. Actually, really? yeah, no, it was it was trying to find my way and not not wondering. And what yeah, age was this? This was around about sort of late teens, twenties. Okay, um, and it was it was sort of mid twenties that I decided to no early twenties, I suppose, that I decided to that I enjoyed shooting cyber side so much. And I found the British cyber side championships and then yeah. the European cyber side championships. And I thought, yeah, I think maybe I should have a go at that. And it took me best part of a year to drum up the confidence to actually. That's a, enter. Well, it's actually a big step, it isn't is. it? Yeah, um, a lack of confidence, and I—I I mean, I see with people coming in the school, mm. um, most people's fear when they're shooting is the the fear of the reaction of others. There you go. This is you know key. that strange thing. So Simon stands in front of ten. Wow, we're a bit nervous. Yeah. Simon shoots a clay on his own, uh, doesn't miss. Yeah, funny, it's, isn't it? It's mindset. It's very strange. Mindset is crucial, and it's it, it comes down to. What I'm beginning to look into now, which is the way that the brain operates when it comes to these things, and I find the entire subject really, really interesting. And I know you, you, you've got a lot to say on that, and that's partly why you're here. What, mm. just, just backtracking yeah. very quickly, <clears throat> just literally just touching on your lack of confidence yeah. as, a, as a young... What do you think that came from? Just It's... Uh, I mean, I could look back and say, why did I have it? Or I can look back, or I can look now and say, thank God it's gone. Were you born here? Yeah, I was born in Germany. Right. Um, Do you think that played a part coming really, to another country? Not really. No. Um, it's it's just a question. It comes down to, and with with that, you know, you know as well as I do that to, to teach well, you have to have empathy. Yes. So you have to understand a client's lack of confidence if they have one, uh, and that comes down to the way that the lizard brain works. 
in that we have basically two responses that are, we're preconditioned to have through evolution, um, which is fight or flight or submit. Yes. Um, freeze and submit. Yeah. Or rest and digest. Yeah. Now, with those basic at reactions to any given situation, you also you can see market, marketing people um, have analysed this quite cleverly as well, yeah. um, and they have a thing called fear of missing out, FOMO. Yes. So they sell. You know that's why I know some a, people with FOMO yeah. actually. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> My daughter's one of them. There you go. But but <laughs> the the interesting thing from our perspective is FOPO, fear of other people's opinions. Yes, I'd say that's the. Uh, it's absolutely debilitating. Yes. Yes. If that is what consumes you, you will never perform at your best level. And did you experience a little bit of that in your late teens when you went yeah. to that first? I think everybody does to a certain extent. Yeah. It takes, I think you, I have to, you have to have a special arrogance if you don't, as a youngster, fear what other people think. Because Absolutely. there are people with hugely more experience than you and much more knowledge than you. And if you don't take the opportunity to learn from them, mm. then A, you're probably a bit of an arse, mm -hmm. and B... Yeah you're missing out on a huge opportunity how to did, extend your knowledge. How did you overcome that initial from when you first went to that clay shoot and thought, wow, God. Um, because you get, you, when you show a little bit of arrogance, you get a slap verbally. Yes. Um, and that's how you get over it and you think, oh, hang on a minute. No, I've just been checked there. Mm. What have I done? What am I getting wrong? How can I get that right? Mm. And then you suddenly realise that that sort of incremental self-improvement where you're reacting to situations differently and instead of, you know, if you get a bollocking, instead of cowering away and thinking, oh dear, I don't, I don't want to show my head anymore, you go, right, I've got it wrong. Okay, take it on the chin. Let's not get it wrong again. But your and lack then you of, gradually get better. Your lack of confidence w wasn't an arrogance, though, was it? It was more of a sheepish... Was a it little of, bit, yeah, more yeah. of an introverted and, and, sheepish. And yeah, so how did you overcome that? Because that, I would say, is tough. I mean, yeah, the arrogant to be slapped, is, yeah. but I'd say it's tougher for, for the underdog to think, oh, crikey, I'm it's, really out of my comfort zone. It's, <clears throat> it's an appreciation that your knowledge has grown yeah. over time and that what... It's very, it's very difficult well, to say. And I think it's, it's really relevant. because I, I suppose actually what it comes down to, and I think it is too, which, which is why it's very, very hard to define properly, but I think it comes down to the fact that you realise, there is a realisation that it is a very damaging aspect of your psychology mm. and that to overcome it can open doors to more enjoyment and other avenues of success and actually... It's making the decision not to cower away anymore. Oh, I would, I would agree. And here, I think that's here, a conscious decision. Yeah, here is the pain. There's a gargantuan gap. There's yeah. utopia, the other yeah. side. But it's making that leap. It's yeah. covering that gap, isn't and I, it? And I think there has to be a realisation that you can't get to the good things without a little bit of pain. Yes. And if that means confronting your shyness, yes. as I had to, then so be it. You've got well, to do I, it. I've said to a lot of people in the school, and some might laugh and some might knock it, I don't really care yeah. um, because it works for me. And I say to people, this is going to sound ridiculous and this is going to make you feel really uncomfortable. Mm. But I suggest you go to that local clay shoot this Sunday, mm. go with another, so at least one can button whilst you yeah. shoot. Make sure you go in front of a big group. Get in the cage and miss some. Yeah, Go and do it. I yeah. dare you. I dare you. And I bet you money on it that when you get to the second cage, you'll care not at all. It's very interesting. You've just reminded me of, of my first ever competition at school. We had a, we had a, uh, a clay shooting club. Um, we had to fight tooth and nail to get the money for a, the fuel for a minibus to go from Hertfordshire to Shugborough Shooting School in Shropshire. Right. 40 for the, minutes away, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nothing is. Um, and that, um, that was my first experience of clay shooting. And I had exactly that experience. Cage one. Mm. And there are hundreds of kids not hundreds but it felt like hundreds that's, yes. that's the kind of there your mind seven, does play trick there, but, yeah. well, there, but there were at least 25 30 yeah. kids waiting to shoot behind me yeah, listen, more and than i two, was physically a, yeah. shaking and it was a fairly straightforward pair uh simultaneous pair coming off the left bank and quartering slightly away and i laid a big fat egg on the card and i just wanted the ground to swallow me up i think i was probably 15 at the time 14 mm. 15 mm. um and i just thought i hate this i hate it and I thought, and, and I think that's probably going back to the confidence thing is that was the nadir. It was that complete absence of joy in what I thought I enjoyed. Yeah. And then going, right, well, yeah, we've either got to give this up or we're going to have to get past it. Yeah. And those are, those are our two options.
And I do this with my kids today. I only give them two options. Yeah. You know, you either do this or you do this. Which one do you want to do? Make a decision. Yeah. And I had to. And I think the fact that I didn't go, well, I did do a lot of fishing in my teens, but I didn't go, right, that's shooting done. I want to go fishing. Um, was probably the start of gradually improving. But it, it takes, you have to make that decision. Yes. Yeah. You've got to commit to it. Yeah. Yeah. But then it becomes an enjoyable journey rather than a sort of a, yeah. you know, a sort of a, a scary or, you yeah. know, tentatively sort of, you yeah. know, approached thing. Yes. Um, I know that, you know, with a lot of the top shots, the, I mean, I, I, I don't want to, I shouldn't pluck names because mm. I have no favouritism, but <laughs> I mean, they're lovely people. Mark Windsor, yep. James Bradley Day. Yep. Um, well, all of them, there's loads of them. I just pluck those two out of thin air. That, that for them, the game becomes, and probably even less so, but let's say 5% ability, mm. 95% mindset yeah you know they've got the tricks they're either natural or it's the ten thousand hours or whatever yeah combination of stuff that's created an, an amazing shot yeah and it all becomes a head game i yeah. always remember watching um george digweed shoot at west london mm. and as normal you know he's in the shoot off he won mm. uh huge crowd and he just lapped it up mm. and he missed uh, i think one or two yeah he, he came out on top of the end yeah but there was just no, it was just totally, relaxed. it was almost joking with the crowd. Yeah. Um, and I thought, isn't it incredible to get to that level? Yeah, where he's comfortable there. Yes. Yeah. And, and it comes back to a very interesting quote from Billie Jean King, who said, pressure is a privilege. Yes. Um, you have to have earned your position to feel that pressure. You have to have worked hard to get yourself in the position to actually feel the pressure of a Wimbledon final. Yeah. And that's a very interesting summation of of what we're talking but, about but it's an inner confidence it isn't is it? you yeah. know i remember once upon a time like you like everybody and i think if you haven't experienced this as a shot you're probably fibbing mm. that you will miss the simple target yeah you know because you want to hit it so badly and you don't want to look stupid in front of the people you're with yeah. fear of other people uh, years down the line you can pop the target. you have an inner confidence when you miss one <laughs> concentrate on the next one yeah i think uh, but that, that that's the that's the the higher level of game shooting where you realize that actually missing is part of what we do yes because if we went out and we nailed everything we shot at we put the gun down and we'd pick up a Take driver up and yeah, go exactly. you know, and spend our weekends doing that exactly. there would be no point the fact that there are challenges to be faced is what we are looking to to put ourselves amongst. So yeah, it's coming back to not picking names. I, one of the European Championships, uh, side by side championships, they, they're, EJ Churchill run a, their European Championships on a hundred registered course. So you get some you know very very good C, C, you know, CPSA yeah. clay shots going around that. Yeah. And I distinctly remember one year being so almost following around Richard Folds. I happened to be shooting just behind. Lovely him. guy and another amazing shot. I've never seen timing like it. Ah. It was a, like an atomic clock. Now, you see, that's interesting, isn't it? And we uh, change, change yeah. tack. It never it's wavered. styles. Yeah. I, funnily enough, I saw him shoot as well some years ago. Um, he really is the Iceman. Yeah. I mean, his movement is minimal, yeah. it's like relaxed. A, it's like a metronome. It's, oh, it, the, no, timing the timing is never perfection. Wavers. It's very interesting to watch. You only, I mean, you improve by watching these people shoot. I mean, yeah. it had a, a profound effect on me watching his timing. Yeah, and I thought, oh, that's. You know, well, this to. is what drew me towards <laughs> coaching. Yeah, was actually when you stop. I think it's like everything when you stop and 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 sort of actually watch, not just look, but actually watch. You know, you could think, well, ten people shooting a gun works. Well, it's ten people with ten guns. Mm. Actually, it's ten totally different mm. stories going on. Yeah, and I found that hugely interesting. And looking at the top shots, yeah. but more so looking at just people shooting. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I remember watching uh, when I first met Alan Rose, and I had the, the pleasure of working with that guy for a couple of years. Yeah, and and the way he, you know, this obviously Stanbury esque, but it was just, it was just fluid. Yeah. You know, and this guy would whack things off the tower just as they've come out the trap, and it was he wasn't trying to show off. It was just yeah, it was just poetry in motion. Yeah, I mean, I I try and pull uh, everything I can from different sports and different people who've reached the top in different sports by watching what they do, how they conduct themselves as well, because that's a big thing for me. Is is it's no for me, it's no longer about um, you know killing yet more pheasants and partridges. No, it's about how you conduct yourself in everything that you do. But watching Roger Federer go about his business. Yeah. You watch his backhand, it's effortless, utterly mm. effortless. The timing is perfect. And even when it when he makes a mistake, 
he still seems to have more time than anybody else because his reactions are so much quicker than everybody else because his experience tells him what you know what is the ball is likely to do before the the opponent has actually struck it yeah. so that gives him half a second more as I, i've said elsewhere but it's the way he approaches a mistake as well. When he when he nets a return of serve, mm. he just gives it a little bit of a rehearsal shot, gives it half a second to debrief himself and learn what he can from a mistake, and then moves to the other side of the court and faces the next serve. It's funny, isn't it? That that okay, and I'll, I'll pick shooting. Strangely enough, that the, that when you're taught to shoot, it's a, a, a an almost a generic process, mm. right? But that the magic actually seems to appear when you get to that point of proficiency, that, that point that actually the real wonder and magic occurs, but it's from the person. Yeah. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, it's so, a reflection of your you know, character. We, we teach, you know, how to stand, gun up, you know, pre-mounted and then yeah. gun down and, and people get to that point and then they shoot for a few months like that. But then they, they, they almost personalise it or they find that, that magic. Yeah, and so it's interesting. We've mentioned a few names, there, and there are many names and many superb shots, ladies mm, and gents, absolutely. right? Yeah. But when you look at them, they're all doing the same thing in the sense of getting high scores, winning competitions, mm -hmm. staying up in the league, whatever. Um, but they're all very different. Yeah. That's what I found interesting. Yeah, so, that's... so the real wonder is actually is not generic. Yeah. It's almost personalised. It's almost just a magic. Yeah. And I mean, that's why I was really interested in in when I heard you talking about the. Am I right in saying you you, you studied it at uh, the the Chinese sort of history? Yeah, I did a, a master's uni. degree at Edinburgh in in Chinese religions and Chinese art. Yeah, um, it was. I would have done straight history, um, but actually, to be honest, I think straight history would have bored the hell out of me. I was going to say you should have really been on Antiques Roadshow, <laughs> shouldn't you? You know, old guns, Chinese oh, cards. No, that's, that's Bill Harriman's. That's Bill Harriman's gig. I'm not going to take Uncle Bill's food out of Uncle Bill's mouth. Not that they'd have me anyway. But. Um, but yeah, no, I would have done straight history, but you know, the idea of, of you know staying the entire time in the English Civil War for four years would have because Scottish university courses were four years at the time. Yeah. Um, that would have bored the hell out of me. So I did religious studies because oh, it would have been better viewed as world religions because it allowed me to pot off in different timelines. I could be doing uh, Aztec one month and I could be going into ancient Egypt the other. Both have pyramids and the combination, sure. the, you know, comparison between the two is interesting for what yeah. they use them for. Yeah. Um, but it's the constant timeline throughout history is is religion and spirituality and how mankind approaches it, yeah. um, what they get from it, um, how many wars it causes, yes. um, how much, you know, spiritual fulfillment yeah, people out get this. out of it. Yeah. Um, and it is a constant source of fascination to me. I, I am, you know, I, I would say that I'm not, religious or a believer but no. i i respect you know the fact that it matters to uh, somebody who's deeply christian makes it matter to me the fact that it's important to you makes it important to me because i want to understand where your well, feeling comes from i think from. the interesting thing is and funnily enough we muttered this with 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 another guest a couple of weeks ago that uh, you know me personally i'm not religious mm. at all um i believe in ghosts i believe in mother earth i mm. believe there's something else don't know what it is and when I find out, I probably won't be able to tell you. So it's just a one-way street. But mm. uh, I think where, wherever anybody can find their solace, their yeah, calmness, their you know place of wonder, yeah. then then I, I think I came across good a, very, for them. a very interesting. You know, the, the forums and the internet in general is, is tends to be a uh, an interesting place to hang out. Uh, and in, in you know ten fifteen years ago, it was all forums, and the American rifle shooter forums are particularly fascinating for their broader <laughs> range of opinions. But there was one quote that at, I don't know what I was on the forum for, but I was just leafing through trying to find some information about a particular caliber. And they had a habit of listing all the calibers and rifles that they used underneath their post. Yeah. Um, and then a pithy quote, some of them. And one of the quotes just stopped me in my tracks because <laughs> I happened to be at university at the time, and I was. And the quote said, everybody sees God differently. I see him on a mountainside at dawn. Mm. And he was, a, he was a deer hunter. He was an elk hunter from Wisconsin or somewhere right. like that. And I thought, that is brilliant. That is an absolute summary of how many people who go hunting, who go wildfowling, who go game shooting, who go pigeon shooting, feel that they connect with the land around them. Yes. It's the, that most people don't put a name to it or can't put a handle on it, but they know there's something deep down there that's touching them. Yes. Spiritually. Yes. They get that 
sense that they are part of something larger than themselves. If indeed that ultimate being is God, I would say go. everybody has their... Yeah. Con- I know you're quoting someone else, but yeah, uh, yeah for but, me it's that connection, isn't it? But you, can, you can find that spirituality in, in, in lots of different places. That's you a can, great you, sales pitch, isn't it? Everybody yeah. sees God differently. That's exactly. assuming there is a God, right? And the fact... <laughs> well, this guy, obviously, there's you know, yeah. strong religion sentiment yeah, yeah. in, in, in the deer hunters sure. of the northern US. But yes. um, the fact that you could find it on a, you know, on a blood and snot forum... <laughs> it's, it's so and you can find a quote it? like that, which, yeah. which you know, I just I found it very interesting, and it, it, you can translate that across everything that we do when we are hunting our own supper, um, and the spectacular imagery and scenery that we find ourselves witness to. Yeah. Um, and if you're if you're not keyed into that, if you don't think that there's something there, you're probably missing out. I would agree entirely. Um, and you've probably got something to learn. Mm. Um, and you know, I, I take great delight. In watching a woodland come alive, sitting up a high seat, yes. or watching a, the shift change at, at dusk. Early as, mornings for me are, yeah. are, yeah, I find the mind can 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 wonder, yeah, reminisce, and it's like meditation. Smell, oh no, it is totally. It's like active meditation. meditation for us, yes. and we can do that on a peg. When you're, yeah. I mean, I I get this feeling, January, you know, back end of the season when I tend to do the majority of my game shooting, I'll stand on a peg on a crisp, you know, January morning, and the air is just champagne and the anticipation of what is to come on the first drive, trying to calm yourself, it's active meditation for me on the on the first drive. It doesn't matter where I am. Mm. It's just, you know, you're there with your dog. Sometimes I'm there with, with one of my children loading for me. It's just all round perfect you, place to be. Do you be. choose to do that, or does that just is that a default of being in that position? That is just part of it naturally for I you. Think, you find yourself linking in. I think it's sort of- something that I I found... Is it conscious or subconscious? It used to be conscious. Right. It's now something I just do. And just, you do that over over time. You practice at that and you get better to, to just move into, shift gear into forgetting the fact that you've got 65 emails in your inbox, forgetting the fact that there's 15 different bills to pay on your yeah. desk. And you shift gear into just that, the privilege of being in that, beautiful natural world surrounded by people who are like-minded and engaged in the same exercise yeah. all you know hopefully pulling for each other sure. um, working as a team uh, in different teams as well i mean you've yes. got the beaters there you've got the pickers up there you've got a team of guns here and you've got to shoot as part of a team sure uh, in a perfect world anyway um so it doesn't always go right but um <laughs> particularly shooting with some of my friends yeah. um, <laughs> they must be mine as well so yeah <laughs> so yeah it's but I, I, to answer your question, yes, it's something that that I used to consciously do. Now it's something I'm I'm lucky enough to be able to do unconsciously. Does that is that just I uh, say just because it's a thing of wonder and something I buy into? Is that in itself just you placing earthing yourself in that location? Done, and that's a wonderful mindset. Does that mindset that sort of sensation? put you in what I'm going to call the zone for yes. shooting? Or could, but what I'm basically mm. saying is, could you feel that sort of linked wonder but still maybe have a bad day with a gun? I know that's yeah, a bit of a difficult um, question. But it, it, the beauty of it is it can do two things. It can, it is not only is it the extra payoff of going game shooting is that feeling um, because on top of, you know, the ability to have some exhilarating sport and a, and a couple of breaks at the end of the day and a decent meal as a result. Um, but it is, it is, yeah, you get that sense of, of fulfillment, um, but it also makes you more likely to shoot your best mm. as well. So it's doing two things. Um, and it's about finding your fluid motion and finding your relaxation to allow yourself to shoot to the best of your ability. And that, that doesn't mean that you have to hit everything. No, as we've said before, it's not about hitting everything. It's about performing to your best ability, depending on where you are in your timeline of your shooting career as a beginner or as as a a veteran. Yeah, you know, it's about finding your best self Mm. um, and shooting your best. And it's it's not about being better than anyone else. No, it's about being a little bit better than you were last time. Well, game shooting is not a competition, is it? It's about being better than you were yesterday. Yes. And that is something that translates across a lot of what we do in life. It's about constant improvement at little margins of improvement about being better than you were yesterday. Yes. At whatever you're doing, whatever you choose to do, whether it's whether you, you're cooking what you've shot, 
or whether you're trying to shoot. It's about because it's very interesting, isn't it? And I, you know, and you come across them, and I come across them uh, lots of the time. Which is people that come in here usually for a lesson or yeah. a straightener on the tower or something like that, um, and they'll say, "Oh, last outing, I couldn't miss." Yep, it was fabulous. God, two weeks before that, I was fucking awful. Yep. And I, you know, and I shot loads of shells, and 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 you say, "Well, hey, how's how's work?" You know, well, yep. it's been pretty steady. Yeah. Um, you know, red wine, yeah, still are the same. You know, yeah. wife, okay, yeah, children too. Yeah. Why? Why does that happen? Yeah. Why does that? What's that shift? Because I've always thought if we could, you know, turn that into a liquid and pop it in a little bottle, mm. we'd um, we could retire. But it's so quickly. personal. Yeah. It's what is so it? Personal. Is it one thing that's personal to everybody or is it something different for everybody which now that is a, i know that's a bit of a I, it's it's you what have, is that you thing? have to treat it on a case by case basis it's yeah. uh, it's not something that's that's you know i had a client say to me the other day he put it he put it very funnily he said jeez i tell you what mate i shot like a guest at an afghan wedding <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's just a brilliant way of summing up. Tons of ammunition expended for no result. So, yeah. I like it. <laughs> yeah, but it is, yeah, it's, and we, you know, it, it's entirely personal. We had to, to try and track through, and it turned out he'd, you know, been in the pub the night before, and that's probably why he went wrong for it. Yeah, so he was relaxed. Um, he was, oh, sorry, he was he relaxed. Was, sorry, he his, was relaxed. It went wrong but, for him. But yeah. his, his, yeah. his eyesight had, you know, yeah. his focus. Had double vision. So. You know, you can see it when, you, when you've had a, a big night and you take the dogs for a walk in the morning, and you're like, yeah. oh, wow, hang on a minute. That's just everything's a little bit fuzzy. It's because yeah. you know your your brain is subject to a whole load of chemical processes trying to deal with your enjoyment from the night before, yeah. um, and you know it takes time to shift. Yeah. Um, doesn't matter how much you rehydrate. It doesn't matter how much diurolite and paracetamol you cram into yourself. It's sure. still going to have an effect on what you do, um, and it can be it, th those effects. I think can shift depending on on who you are, depending yes. on whether you're diabetic or not, depending on yes. whether you're. You know, you're of a certain age and your your eye dominance tends to fluctuate or not. Yeah. It depends entirely on who you are. I had a very interesting conversation the other day with a uh, a friend of mine who left the army. He was an Apache pilot okay, in the wow. army. And um, he's left master eye dominant traditionally as he was growing up as a teenager. He sure. shot off his left shoulder, left master eye dominant. Then when he went into Apache pilot training, they have to concentrate on two things at once. They have to concentrate on their head-up display with their weapon system, yes, which is one eye occluded with a, a display. Yes, they have to read a lot of information out of one eye. Yes, but they also have to look straight ahead, flying the aircraft. Right. So okay. they're splitting their vision and feet and hands going. Wow. They got a lot to do. <laughs> oh, wow. Now he's a very very talented sportsman, yeah. and his shooting nosedived right. because of it. Because his eye dominance had completely altered. Because his right eye was suddenly doing much much more work for a day job. Yeah. Um, and his left eye, wh which was traditionally dominant, was not. So And that can be changed. a shift that happens as well, can't yeah. it? Middle age with guys yeah. largely. Yeah. I, I don't uh, know it what does. Yeah, it does happen. I mean, it is. It, there, there is no subject, and I've recent experience of this on social media, there is mm. no subject like it to get a bunch of shooting professionals <laughs> kicking each other in the groin than eye dominance and gun fit. Just yeah. trust me. And, and how to fix it. Is <laughs> and it how to the glasses? Fix it, yeah. Is it the and, bolt on the barrel? Is and it? the point I think that we all came to after this protracted debate mm. was that each client is an individual. Yeah. And without a proper diagnosis, you cannot get a proper prescription. Yeah. So you have to find out what's going on in a person's life to try and work out why their performance is fluctuating. Um, and certainly with uh, that friend of mine who, an ex-Apache pilot, now farmer, um, his, you know, his eye dominance has shifted back to left eye now because he's been out of the military for six years. Interesting. Oh, okay. So his shooting's now back on form. Wow. Um, which is, and that, that's absolutely fascinating. And there are other aspects, uh, there are other areas of working life where that can happen as well. Keyhole surgeons. I've never surgeons. heard of it going back. Mm, interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Keyhole surgeons, they're looking at four different screens. Right. So that their eyes are drawn in very different ways. City traders, two different screens. Yes. A lot of the guys in my office... Um, you know, they all use twin screens. Mm. Mm. Um, and I think we're going to find this as coaches as we come out of lockdown. How, mm. much, how much time have you spent looking at uh, a small screen about... Yeah, a long time. 30 centimetres yeah. away from your face. Yeah. I have. Yeah, I have. Um, I've got some scary numbers coming back on my phone every <laughs> I time. Look. Every time I get a weekly update of your screen <laughs> time has increased YouTube, by 4,000%. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay. Um, but I think that's going to... We're going to see that. Yeah. filtering through shooting schools. I tell you, it's, it's interesting. And it's it, I, actually, it, it, it's taught me to evolve as a coach. And by that, you know, I, I teach a sort of form, I suppose, 
branching from a Stanbury yep. uh, sort of style, all right, with our own sort of personal take wrapped around that. Yeah. And probably like you, I've been taught to look at the bird, look at the target, move the gun, pull the trigger. Yeah. We don't look at the barrel. We don't yeah. look at the bead. And, and if I'm honest, I put my hands up, you know, years ago, I used to see these sort of contraptions and things coming out. And I think, crikey, you know, you don't want to get people looking at the bead or looking at the side of the barrel. You know, we've been taught to do this. Yeah. But actually, it's a lesson, isn't it? That, 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 that there is a large sort of proportion of people that are, <clears throat> you know, similar in their, in, in their sort of approach. But actually, there's an amount of people that may require that little trick that's not related yeah. to, to tra- tradition or because everybody says we don't do that, we don't do that. You know, and actually, there are quite a lot of people who shoot beautifully who will, in a split second, look at the bird, look at the muzzle, look at the bird, and yeah. kill cleanly and neatly. Yeah, this... And actually, if that little... I know Ben's bought out the yeah. little thing that goes the on the muzzle. Yeah. yeah, you know, things like that. Yeah. So you can't poo-poo. I know it no, probably won't go out to the masses. I don't know. And I'm... This this is a conversation, a very interesting conversation I had with Ed Lyons, the sports vision specialist yes. the other day. Yeah, um, no, he's a he, clever guy. Yeah, he, he very kindly helps me out with... Uh, when, I want, when I'm looking for an, an expert opinion on vision, I get away. Mm. Um, and he's very generous with his time to me. Um, so, and he said, look, the simple fact is that some of these solutions will work for some people some of the time. Yes. You cannot disregard them. Um, it's about it's about finding a coach who understands their limitations as well and yes. can refer to a specialist when a specialist help is required. So, and that's coming back to my point about you have to have a proper diagnosis before you can get a proper prescription. Mm. Um, and yeah, there are many different solutions on the market um, mm. and there are some people who find their own solutions and yeah. there are no right answers here or wrong answers no, here. No, but it's personal. It's, it it's is. to the individual, it's isn't it? It's intensely personal, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it can fluctuate depending on your personal circumstances as we discussed earlier. Uh, but to give yourself the best chance is, is trying to get into that relaxed state of mind where you allow your, yourself to flow yeah. um, with a shotgun and find your fluid movement, which is the best place to be. Which leads me on beautifully because that was one of the first things I heard you rattling on about which yeah. is the sort of, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's good enough yeah that's about accurate i'm being kind that's right. um <laughs> you know mixed in with the the chinese history yeah. and the very sort of zen well you didn't use zen like that's my terminology yeah. but, but the is. sort of zone i think yeah. that might be an americanism but yeah. um, um and we talked about this earlier about finding you know that 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 place that just almost seems to appear without you knowing yeah now how does the Chinese history relate to that? Why is that um, interesting to you? And how does that work within your coaching? Or your shooting, actually. Several, your shooting. That's, that's, how long it's you three in one. Go. How much time have I got left? <laughs> <laughs> uh, where does it stem from? It stems from a Confucian and a Taoist, the two major religions, uh, two of the three major religions of East Asia. Uh, Confucian, Taoist and Buddhist view of right action and civil behavior and everything that goes with it. So, um, so it's the, almost like a martial... It, well, the, there's, martial, there's two things. In, in civilian life, um, the the Taoists and the Confucians, um, the Confucians certainly, but the Taoists had a, a similar outlook in the fact that uh, even the emperor was subject to the laws of heaven and right action should be observed for you to be a just ruler. That comes from behaving in a measured, gentlemanly way with restraint doesn't matter how much power you have doesn't matter how much experience you have how much money how much skill you have with a shotgun that's how we come back to shooting. yes you have to you have to act like a gentleman to put it yes. in western terms yes when it comes to athletic ability with with this sort of east asian view of of getting peak performance for one of a better phrase out if you have to there are very many different quotes that come out of the martial artists of Asia to mm. to illustrate this. But um, there's one that's, it took, I think it's something along the lines of, it took 10,000 repetitions to perfect a technique and it took another 100,000 to understand them. Right. So it, it's it's things like that. So it's it's tapping into a, it's not sub, it's, it is a subconscious ability because it's not coming from your conscious mind because 
it, as you can see, this is very difficult to explain. <laughs> I know. Um, the, the, I really, all I call, wanted to do was eat a flapjack uh, so I didn't enough, have to talk. Yeah, so I do. Have a flapjack have a now because I'll be, I'll be on a while. <laughs> um, yeah, so that flow experience, that that getting in the zone, as the Americans call it. I'm fine, thank you. Uh, coffee would be lovely. Thank you very much. Getting in the zone, as the Americans call it. The the, the Europeans refer to it as the flow experience. That was coined by uh, Sizem Mahaili, the, the very experienced psychologist who's now working in the US, or was working in the US. Yeah. Um, and in East Asia, it is it is mushin, the mind of no mind, in Japanese terminology, uh, and that is about getting rid of your ego to allow your best performance to come out. So and doing it for just actions. So the martial artists of East Asia are very strong on, especially uh, you see this a lot in Taekwondo. It's a huge part of Taekwondo, which uh, a very good friend of mine, Ollie, has has, has taught me a huge amount about martial arts because his his level of expertise in taekwondo is one of the best around and can i quickly yeah. cut in there just for two seconds and yeah. say is that almost that thing where you i was going to relate it to being in the field yep go. you know the big pheasant comes out you go up through bang oh what a shot hit it yeah next one comes out i want to do that again yes and bang, you can't repeat miss, it can't yeah. repeat it because all of a sudden you're trying to control that action because you want the same result and your want your your need for your ego to be satisfied has overtaken your natural ability yes and that compromises your natural ability by doing it uh, and it is very interesting in that you can f you can measure this physiologically so what happens in your brain we're coming back to the the brain processes yes. and, and it's seen in in the mushin of east asia it's seen in the flow of europe it's seen in the zone of american basketball players is your the part of your brain that controls ego controls conscious thought controls uh, fight or flight response well not, not fight or flight response but it controls visual processing and controls what you consider right action or not right action that is the frontal cortex the prefrontal cortex yeah. and that part of the brain actually shuts down when you move into a flow experience and all of a sudden those processes are shifted to a different part of your brain that is much more akin to controlling your fight or flight response, your your lizard brain, for want of a better phrase, that that actually comes from our, our evolutionary history. It's called transient hyperfrontality. Basically, that part of your brain shuts down, and a different part of your brain takes over that is no not interested in ego. And can, do, you, do you think you can train to bring to sort of create this? I'm going to call it a sensation. This mindset is that a meditative sort of approach? Yes, or, you yeah? can. But the, the irony is, the more you want it to happen, mm. the less likely it is to happen. So let me, and I'm, on, I'm plucking this name for no reason, because there's so many I could use as an example. Mm. I'm just going to say Mark Windsor. Yeah. Okay, great shot, lovely guy. Yeah. Why is he a good shot? Well, Mark's competitive shooting. Yeah. Um, I mean, he has been on top for the last few years. Yes. And he's won everything he's entered. Um, yes. And I had a chat with Mark at Swinton Park when I bumped into him the other day. He's a lovely guy he to talk to. He is a fabulous great guy. chap, yeah. Um, and it, you'd have to ask him, to be honest with you. But his Sorry, ability well, I to have taken, control... What is your take on, yeah, on someone like him? This isn't to do with competitive clay shooting. I don't think you can get the same results from a flow experience in the kind of competitive clay shooting at the top you see, level. See, that's what I'm trying to edge into. Yeah. Because you it, can in game shooting, yeah. but I don't think you can in clay shooting. I mean, you, there, there, it is possible. But you can almost imagine it would be wor worse that, you know, the last stand, mm. you know, we've got X, we need Y to finish. It's on the last two pairs. Yeah. I really need it. Bang, miss. Yeah. And the very best shots can control their actions and is that their form of flow, do you think? That they Probably can switch is. off from everything, switch off from everybody behind them, yeah, almost it's switch a, the pressure off? It's, it's not flow in the sense that I understand it, but it is a, it's a control through the absence of control hmm. that they probably have mastered that is not normal for B and C class shooters. Yes. Um, now, yeah, I mean, when you get to that level, it is all about your ability to handle the pressure in a, in a shoot-off. But it almost becomes... Or in a final. I see it, I mean, personally, I'm certainly not arguing with you because you know far more about it than I do, but I almost see it as one of the same thing. And my crap example or analogy would be that flow can be created through meditation, literally mm -hmm. sat or staring yeah. or, you know, eyes closed, however you meditate. 
and Flo, when I think of someone like Bruce Lee with his moves and his power and his yeah. sort of three yeah. inch punch or whatever it was, and this sort of this sort of inner energy that he used to have that yeah. would, you know, to something quite different, quite competitive. Yeah. So you've got the flow with the personal sort of enhancement, yeah. and you've got the flow with the you know co- opponent. Yeah. The the difference between that kind of competition. Is there a difference? Yeah, there is. Um, is because you have to be reactive and fluid to be able to react to your opponent's movement. Mm. He actually, the quote that Bruce Lee came out with, my movement is a result of your movement. Yes. So if I rely on a specific, or if he, he used to, the way he would approach it, is he, if he relied on a specific technique, swing through or pull away yes. or maintain lead, then he was doing himself a disservice. He was not able to react to what the opponent was doing. Yes. So, and his teacher, Ip Kai Man, would say, relax, calm your mind and focus on your opponent's movement. Yes. Now, with competition clay shooting, you know exactly where the target's going to appear because they, they have to be, by dint of the rules, he, the same target for everybody. He a jiu-jitsu um, background, Wing Chun. He? Wing Chun, yeah. sorry, that was sort of laughed at by Yeah, by the Japanese. Most, yeah. yeah. And, uh, until that, that went badly for the Japanese. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, but, but with comp- competition clay shooting, the, the targets are necessarily the same for everybody because that's the level playing field. They have to be, otherwise it's a no bird if it fluctuates beyond a you know a certain flight line. Mm. So you know exactly where it's going to appear. You're exactly where your pickup point is going to be. You're in exactly where your kill point is going to be. And you know exactly which technique you can employ to best shoot that target. Now, that is competition clay shooting. You, ha- you have to understand your performance and your sight pictures, your lead pictures, and everything else, mm. as far as I understand it. I mean, I don't compete at those levels. Sure. But, but this is what I'm learning from watching these guys is, is how they are methodical in what they do. Mm. Um, and uh, Anthony Matarese in the States says, uh, a very successful uh, American clay shooter, his, one of his points is there's caring too much yeah. and there's caring too little. Yeah or not caring enough is how I think he puts it. And in the middle is where you need to be. So if you care too much, you tense up. But if you don't care enough, your focus is sloppy. So you need to be riding, the, as I put it elsewhere, riding the two horses of absolute relaxation and complete focus at the same time. You see, it's interesting. I, it's not a competition. I think, it, yeah. again, it's all, it all sounds wishy-washy. It's down to the individual. I almost see it all as one, but for different uses. Yeah. That's just my take on it. Yeah. You know, we, okay, we're talking about, you know, Bruce Lee and the sort of the movement is reacting to the opponent's movement. Is that not dissimilar to that partridge that comes off over the hedge and without thinking, you don't think maintain, you don't think anything, you just see partridge cheek, bang. Yeah. And you've reacted to the bird. You saw it. If I'd have then said, right, exactly the same bird's coming now. I want you to think about it. I want you to swing through it. No, I don't want you to maintain lead. Yeah. Think there's a high chance you won't connect. Because you're trying to control the movement and your fluidity naturally goes unless you can control your actions to include that fluidity. It, now, if I was on a stand it. and I know what's coming, yeah, I can is... almost see that as 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 difficult, possibly, possibly even more difficult because you know what's coming. Mm-hmm. A bird is, you know, left to right. B yeah. bird is coming over your head. You know, and, and actually knowing what's coming, I find, can make it even tougher. Oh, I agree. I had this very same issue at the Essex Masters uh, two years ago. Mm. Uh, red course, first stand. I think it was red course. First stand. Um, there were two going away birds. One was higher than the other. Yeah. Um, and with my flat shooting hammer gun, uh, it's very easy to shoot over the top. Um, and I said to myself, don't shoot over the top of this. Don't shoot over the top of this. Don't shoot over the top of this. Yeah. And I went in and the first target, I shot clean took, over the top of it. Took its hat off. Yeah. And I came out of that stand and went, Whoa, what's wrong? What's wrong with you? That is a straightforward 10 on the card. Why did you shoot? And I suddenly went, it's because you gave yourself a negative message. Mm. Instead of saying, don't shoot over the top of this and reinforcing a mistake that you were about to make, yes. I should have been saying to myself, shoot underneath this, which is yes. a positive message, not a negative message. Yes. Then I probably would have had a different result. And that was a learning experience for me. So you, th- so you would suggest or say or, or, or back up the fact that, you know, good shooting positive mindset and it sounds like an overuse absolutely don't the, the one of the one of the panel one of the problems with as my limited experience of, of competitive clay shooting compared to others is that you are aware of all the mistakes you can make and being aware of all the mistakes you can make if you've got those at the forefront of your mind guess what you're more likely to make them yeah. but if you try and 
give yourself positive messages rather than focusing on the mistakes you can make, focus on the positive moves you should be making, it's, you get a far different result. Yes. You're more likely to get a far different result, all things being equal. Yes. So again, I mean, that is part of the psychology of any sporting endeavor, really. Um, but it's one of the reasons that I decided to go to a competition um, and I'm, I'm the pillock who turns up in wellies with a cyberside <laughs> hammer gun made in 1910 to the Essex Masters surrounded by Kriegoffs and Parazzis. Great. You know, and, and bless them, that all the, all the referees were going, oh, you don't see many of them. Yeah. Um, oh, that's quite nice. Clearly not the shy teenager anymore. <laughs> no, yeah. No, quite. No. Um, and actually, a one bloke clapped me on the shoulder. Um, Charlie Stewart would clap me on the shoulder last time out and said, geez, mate, you're the only bloke I know who turned up to the Essex Masters in a pair of wellies covered in blood from Monday's car from deer. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't have time to watch them off. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm a bit of a country bumpkin amongst the, amongst the professionals. Yeah, but, absolutely. Um, yeah, Why I not? have fun doing it. Um, and it's it's it's... Again, it's not me measuring myself against, you know, triple no. A class shots because I'm nowhere near them. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you bang in 168 the Essex Masters with a hammer gun made nice. in 1910. Absolutely. I'm feeling pretty good about life. Yeah, I would. So, you know, that was a you know, 80 odd and a Great 70 odd Fabulous. somewhere um, around, you know, some, a pretty stiff test that John puts on. Now, I, I don't know if I should say this because uh, I don't know if it's been released, but I think you might have, and I'll keep it very. Very simple. You yeah. might have written something on a subject about muscle memory. Muscle memory, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or rather, there is no muscle memory. Well, this so, is, again, these so are just, the... These so, are the so, sorry, just yeah, to cut in very can, quickly. So we've yeah, done the mindset it. thing. You've gone up to the stand. Yeah. You know, you've given yourself a negative message and you've missed over the top. Your ability, I'm assuming, as a game shooter, you would largely shoot gun down and you're mounting yeah, into the cheek and yeah. so on. Uh, how do you manage to do that the same every time? What, what's created that? <laughs> uh, this is yeah, a controversial subject amongst coaches is muscle memory. I remember one coach losing his temper at a clay line at ba- oh, uh, when I worked at Bass. That's passion. Somebody mentioned it. And he went, for Christ's sake, muscles don't have bloody memory. <laughs> and he's right, of course. But actually, there's some interesting things going on. Um, and the fact that we refer to it quite a lot um, as a phrase and that the basic fact that the more you repeat an action, the better you get at it, mm. means something is going on. Um, and look, having looked into it, there's some quite interesting things going on. When you build up the fitness of your muscles, your muscles enlarge, and they get each muscle cell has uh, a nucleus, uh, or a smaller collection of nucleuses, myonuclei. If you have some time away from shooting, say, as we all have during COVID, and your muscles atrophy, yeah. um, the muscle cells might disappear or shrink, but the myonuclei remain. The cutting edge science tells us that this is what's going on. So that's why when you are, say you're a bodybuilder and you've bulked up to you know, enter a competition and then you have some time away through injury or whatever and your muscles shrink, it takes you half the time to build up to that level again. Because it's not that you know, you're, you're doing less training it's, or you're doing double the training, it's that the fact that the myonuclei are still resident in the muscles themselves, or they are still hanging around as vestiges. But there's also something else going on as well, which is your muscles to work properly, they need electrical signals from your brain. Yeah. That is, and that comes through the central nervous system. So there's something going on in your brain as well. And I like to think of it in a slightly Zen way, as you probably got Mm. from me already. Yeah. um, That it's like water flowing over rock. The more the water flows over the rock, the more it carves that channel out. And what is actually happening is, the more you practice a movement, the more you practice your gun mount during lockdown and, and away from shooting, which is one of the best things we all know that we can do to improve our swing and our shooting, mm. is get your gun mount as religious and as and as replicable as possible. The What's happening in your brain is that the, the synapses that control those electrical currents coming from your the inside of your brain to fire that electrical signal down the central nervous system to your muscle to go, right, flex now, because yeah. this is what we're doing. The more you practice it, the more those uh, connections are protected by a myelin sheath. Your your body devotes more uh, more of the building blocks, the amino acids, to to be producing myelin to protect those uh, electrical cables and insulate them so the signal is stronger. So So those two things are going on. So what I'm taking from this, and in an ideal world, it seems that it's it's about time spent. Yep. All right. And, and it seems to me that the optimum sort of mindset, so the key actually probably here is not so much practicing amount, uh, it's actually getting into the correct mindset. Because I think what we're saying is the mind doesn't want to be 
too aggressive. Yeah. It doesn't want to be too relaxed. Yep. Wants to be in the middle. Yeah. And if we could find that state of mind, yeah. that zen, that, you know, switched off, tuned in, call it what you like. Yeah. That then practice whilst in that mindset yeah. is probably going to be the most beneficial, the thing that's going to last Absolutely. the longest. Too sloppy, we're not really refined, we're a bit lazy, sod it. Yeah. Aggressive, we're trying too hard, it's yeah. rigid. Yeah. I think that's, so So maybe that's that's something new for me to think about, to yeah. say to people, do you know what? You need to zone out first. Yeah, try and ride the Get two in horses. the groove, yeah. yeah. Then practice the mount in the mirror. Absolutely. <laughs> and to, to do that, there are there are different techniques that you can relax yourself to do that. It doesn't have to be full-on meditation for no. 40 minutes. You don't have to be kneeling on your carpet chanting. That's, no. that's not what we're no, talking sure. about. You can actually, you can you can get yourself towards that kind of mindset by breathing properly. Yes. Um, and if you, the people who put themselves in high-pressure situations so that they can make good decisions under pressure... Uh, do this. They practice breath control techniques. The US Navy SEALs yes. before battle will control their anxiety, control their nerves if they have them, and everybody gets them, I imagine. Yes. By square breathing. Which no, I, is I listen to it. Go on, sorry. Yeah. So that's that's four breaths in, hold for four breaths, four breaths, you know, four seconds of breathing in, hold for four seconds, four seconds breathing and out. Is it up hold through for the nose, four seconds. Out through the mouth. Yes. Yeah, so it's yeah. in, it's in through the nose and out through the mouth traditionally i had, I had a lady to listen literally on a uh, on the radio four literally a week ago talking about the same thing yeah you know that actually um literally a, a, a minute of that it wasn't even that long 30 mm. seconds yeah is actually can bring your heart rate down Does. and can just level the mind yeah really clever another one uh which just sounds a bit more hippy drippy yeah but i mean I, I i do this and it really does work is standing out on the lawn yeah barefooted in yeah, the morning yeah, absolutely to earth yeah to earth yourself yeah ground yourself yeah, yeah ground yourself yeah. exactly now the, you know and 20 I remember years being ago, told that and i thought hold on is someone you know 20 years ago this is all tie-dye and caftans you know yeah this is, sure this is what everybody everybody would look at you going hey what yeah um, but now mindfulness is a massive part of the national health service it's about huge. about not having to treat people with drugs to control their Ill anxiety not having to treat people with drugs to control you know their illnesses. They are they are they are asking people to consider mindfulness to for all the benefits that come with it. So they are. It's not. This is not. Holistic do you think you have medicine. to believe is, in it to use it? Do you think you know? I've got mates of mine. They go on. I walk out on a fucking lawn with no shoes on. Yeah. yeah right. Done. Well, yeah. No, that didn't do anything. Try it. You, yeah. Give it a go. Um, you got what have you got to lose at the end well, of the day quite. by breathing properly? And um, coming back to the breathing side of things, it's not <sighs> chest breathing. No. Because uh, you know, chest breathing is a sign of death. Basically, yes. if you're breathing heavily from your chest, you've either run all over. quite a long way, yeah. or you know your mortality is is catching up with you. This is about breathing from below, using your diaphragm to inhale and breathing through your tummy. Basically, mm. Mm. Um, that is these things have all been learnt from Asian techniques of you know yoga and proper breathing techniques in martial arts. Yeah. They breathe from down here, basically from two inches below your navel. Yeah. is where you should be breathing out, pushing out like that, and that will draw air in naturally. Mm. Um, that is deep breathing, it, um, allowing the bottom of your lungs to absorb the oxygen as well, which makes them more efficient. Yeah. Well, if you're just doing <gasps> chest breathing, all you're doing is inflating this bit here. Yes. So there, there's a different way, you know, there are different ways of doing this. But yeah, I mean, it, it used to be viewed as very hippie, but, you know, people like the US Navy SEALs starting to do it, they know that the guy next to them has gone through the same hellish training regime. They know that he's going to stand by them. All these guys got to do is try and control their heart rate, their nerves, and yeah. their response to fight or flight. Well, I, li I listened to uh, Ollie Ollerton, you know, the ex SAS yeah. guy, and uh, in some of his sort of talks, which are really, he's got a really interesting view on life, actually, and it's very similar. This yeah. sort of very mindful, so, uh, spiritual, almost quite ironic considering he was SP yeah, SBS, I yeah. think. Um, but he, 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 you know, talked hugely about the breathing, mm. the mindset, calming. You know, and it's actually saved yeah, his bacon, work. you know, in a couple of really heated yeah. Um, situations. Yeah. yeah, it does. It's, it's, really it's controlling, it, it's it coming back to those those basic uh, primeval responses that our brains have got us through tens of thousands of years of evolution with, mm. which is, you know, is it going to kill me? Do I need to run away? Do I need to freeze? Yeah. Or am I safe? Yeah. And proper breathing allows you to move away from those responses and exercise different parts of your brain. 
Um, and it allows you to yeah, control all kinds of emotional responses to different situations. But we're talking about from game shooting perspective, this all comes, we cover quite a lot of territory, but it all yeah. comes down to making good decisions with no time yeah. and sometimes under pressure. Are you are you more led by sharing information with people, teaching people, or are you more led by looking in and trying to understand things in, in, in sort of not infinite detail, but in, in great detail? What's your draw, outwards or inwards? I'm fascinated by learning about my responses to different things. Um, I mean, I've had some interesting experiences in my working life where I have, you know, had some pretty crunchy days where my reaction to certain situations would I knew was going to direct my next 10 years of existence. Yes. Um, and however you look at it, when you make career decisions like that, you have to own it. Yeah. You have to say, good decision or bad decision, I've got to make a decision. So this is my best guess. Is there a, such a thing as a bad decision? Mm, I remember I, I going through quite a, a grim time uh, through anyone who's been spent a protracted time with an HR department knows that it can be quite tricky. Right. Um, and I phoned up a friend of mine who's, you know, we all have our wisest friend. Sure. I phoned up my wisest friend and I said, you know, Alex, this is happening, you know, could do with your benefit of your opinion. Yes. And his, his phrase to me was very interesting and it's one I took away and I use this to this day with my children as well, which is he basically just said to me, are you making good decisions? He didn't judge the decisions I'd made hmm. because that wasn't, He's wise enough. He's wise, wise, my wisest friend. He's wise <laughs> enough to know that he was not in a position to judge my decisions. He said, are you making good decisions? Yes. And I thought, oh, that's a very interesting way of doing it because it's total lack of judgment there, but it's causing me to think about what I'm doing. And we do this in the shooting field as well. Mm. You know, when you, you have a choice of whether that bird is sporting or not. Now, I judge people in the shooting field when I'm picking up behind them. Yeah, I do judge them, I have to say. I'm, I'm looking to see how you behave as a picker up because I'm looking to see how much work you're going to give me. <laughs> now, we all know that shooting stuff too low and pillowcasing one yes. is a bad yeah, thing. Yeah, bad news. Yeah. yeah, we don't we want to avoid that. Yes. And that is a bad decision that shot. Yes. We've all done it by accident. I don't mm. know anybody who hasn't. No. But we also as a picker up, I'm looking at you to see what you're going to leave and that's how I judge you any shot. So if you're leaving stuff that's too low, great. If you're leaving stuff that's beyond your ability to kill humanely, that is another level of good decision making. Yes. Now we are in danger as a sport of prioritizing the stuff on the very edge of people's ability. And that is, I think, a problem that we have to face as a sport. Yeah. Now, if you have the right level of equipment and you have the right level of skill, then yeah, you wanna be testing yourself. Mm. Um, but I know where my limit lies. And as soon as I see my children who are starting their shooting career, as soon as I see one of my kids go, yeah, I'm going to leave that. It's probably a bit far. Then I'll know they've passed a test. Yes. Yes. For me, which is about right action. I mean, I love, see I love seeing excitement. I love yeah. seeing emotion. I love seeing people, oh, bugger, bang, you know, shot that yeah. low bird. Didn't mean to. Flew out over the tree, bang. Yeah. I think the key is if you do it again. <laughs> yeah. Then that's the definition there's of madness, issue. isn't it? Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, I think for people to re – I like to see a bit of emotion. Yeah. I like to see a reaction. Yeah. Yes, I don't want to see – You've got to care about hurt, what you're doing. I don't yeah. want to see – yeah, you know, it, it, it should be, you know, done in a, everything done in the correct fashion. But mm. I think that's important. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a – moving away from, you know, the sort of the more ethereal and zen-like and emotional side of things to govern, I have a pet theory that that is mathematical about where I want to be as a as – a, a level of peak performance, certainly in a pigeon height. And this is right. what it came down to me is I know when I'm shooting well in a pigeon height. Yeah. Um, and I have a specific cartridge to kill ratio that I'm looking at. Really? Yeah. Do you not feel you're setting, setting a sort of a, not a barrier, but sort of setting yourself up before you've gone in? No, because it's almost impossible to hit. Right. Okay. It's very interesting this because, okay. uh, it, oh, I see. So this is the one where I want to get 100 clays out of 100 clays. So in my mind, I'll say I'm doing 150. Yeah. But that, no, well, no, no, that's different. That is clay shooting. And clay shooting, I, yeah, I, your, I mean, your aim is always 100%. Sure, yeah. sure. But, uh, that's what yeah. we're trying to it's get to. It's a loose comparison, yeah. but yeah. When you're game shooting, there's a there's a oh, curious okay. point where, as, a, as we touched on before, you don't want to hit everything. That's no. not why we're there. We want to be testing ourselves on the edge of our ability. 
But at some point, although the on farmer the, would want you to hit everything, right? <laughs> well, again, well, let's, okay, let's talk about pheasants and pastures. You want to be, we want sporting shots. We yes. want to be testing ourselves on the edge of our ability. Yes. But we don't want to be shooting so far at stuff so far away that we're going to wound the majority of what we shoot. Definitely at. That is not. inhumane. Absolutely. So somewhere on the line of peak performance, those two lines intersect between when we're shooting well and we're challenging ourselves. But we're not challenging ourselves so much that we're shooting. We've crossed the Rubicon into inhumane behaviour. Yes. Now, when I'm shooting well in a pigeon hide, certainly, and I know decoying is different to pheasant partridge shooting, um, and the, the skill of the decoy is to get them close enough a to shoot. Craft. And, exactly. Yes. Uh, and that is why I think it's the greatest test of so a, a shotgunner's ability. Yes, absolutely. But that's just my opinion. Yep. But I am looking to, you know, at, at three to one, you're not really doing the job. You're scaring one, you're scaring, you know, at four to one, you're scaring three quarters of what you're shooting at and you're yeah. educating those pigeons and they're going to make it harder to for the next decoy who comes along to get them to commit to a whirly because yes. they know it's danger. That's it. That is not doing the job well. Yeah. Um, but you also want a sporting day. And my figure that I've arrived at is 1.618 to 1. Now that is, that's going to sound like <laughs> insanity. Where the yeah. hell did he get that from? I almost say to you, you need to get out more, Simon. I do. Um, I, but this is this is time spent on slow days in a pigeon hive when you go, interesting. I Has wonder lockdown how, been that long? How, wow. how, how, does, how, does, how does the Fibonacci sequence apply to game shooting? Interesting. That's me on a very slow day in a pigeon hive. And it's basically it's 62% of what you yeah. shoot at. Yeah. So at 50%, two to one, yeah. you're, you're okay. Archie Coates used to, you know, the, the yeah. doyen of pigeon shooting, the yes. godfather of what we That's do. That's it. Wrote he used the to Bible. Say, he used to say two to one is you're doing well. Yeah. But where are you, where are you best? Where are mm. you taking on stuff that's difficult and killing the majority of it, but still not crossing the line into inhumane behaviour? Or is good decoying about, and I'm not going to go off into pigeon shooting, I think that's a lovely conversation for another day. You'll mm. have to come back. Yeah. Uh, keep the Volvo. Um, <laughs> but it's the hard, rather like uh, stalking, is getting the quarry as close as you can. Yeah, there is. You know, uh, is that pattern right? Yeah, they're coming in, they're yeah. committing, done, yeah. bang. But, um, but do if you, you need the long pigeon shot? Mm, yeah, I mean, you, you still want to challenge, mm. but you've got to, you've got to know where your line is drawn, and it's drawn mm. for different people of different abilities as sure. well. So some very specialist, high-level game shots who specialise in you know big loads, heavy guns, yeah. and stratospheric pheasants. They, do you buy into that? No, it's not my cup of tea. No, um, to be honest with you, it, I don't get a huge amount of enjoyment of having my shoulder thump that hard. No. Um, I prefer. I get. I don't think there's. I don't think that's the be all and end all of game shooting. There, no. There's so many different facets. I think it could be the end of, but uh... it's certainly something we're going to have to address in the age of steel shot. Yeah. Um, because that that sort of chapter of game shooting has come about through the adoption of heavy guns to absorb heavy recoil to absorb heavy loads of lead pellets. Cannons. Yeah. Yes. I mean. It, I sometimes, and I'm going to upset a few people here, but I sometimes <laughs> like it to firing anti-aircraft shells at stuff on the edge of space. That's not my game. I'm this not is Hound really, Hall. We love uh, upsetting. Yeah, it's exactly. fine. Go on. Go. Speak freely. Um, I think I call it disruptive opinion. But um, yeah, so, you know, answers on a stiff piece yeah. of cardboard in green ink, please. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's not my thing. If no. it's your thing, fine. But sure. do it well. Yeah, that's what it's do like it anything, isn't it? Yeah. Do it properly. Yep. Exactly. Go properly equipped. Yeah. Uh, understand what you're doing. Understand where your limit lies. Yeah. Uh, be aware of that. And don't just chuck lead at stuff that's 80 yards away. Because to be honest, beyond 65, yeah. you're guessing. Absolutely. Yeah, you really absolutely. are. No, I agree. So, and I'm not talking 65 feet. No. I'm talking 65 yards. Yes. And there is a difference. And there is a, uh, one of the unconscious biases we have is, that, is the illusory superiority mm. where we can't measure distance properly. No. We think it's further away than it is. Um, I always remember so, Alan Rose saying, I think it was maybe on a, a bit of film he did, that, uh, you know... And he was being asked about high birds, and he said, you know, 40, 45 yards, 45, 50 yards, anything over that, no consistency. There and isn't. he said, sort of right. Well, yeah, I mean. I know you see edited highlights on, yes, on, on social media, yeah. and that's all really cool. Yeah. But and cartridge <laughs> development has moved on yes, since 1985, yes. 1990. Yes, of yeah, I yeah. mean, we've got, we understand more about big pellets and how they perform through tight chokes, mm. which is producing some surprising results. Yeah. Um, but all of that is no longer relevant in the age of moving away from lead. We've got other things to find. The, the ballistics that, refer, that relate to lead and all of that information that we've built up over the last 150, 200 years worth of shooting, 
no longer applies. Mm. We have to relearn and we have to have the humility to understand that we're going to have to experiment ourselves and find out what works for our style of shooting. Yeah. Um, currently, the most knowledge that I've come across about steel shot and its ability to perform at the edge of range comes from the home loading wildfowlers in the wash right, okay. who are killing geese, and I mean killing geese yes. with steel yes. at extended range because their ability as home loaders to go beyond CIP pressure limits and cartridges yep. means they can get the best out of their shot sizes. Now, they are not available to the general public, mm. and without a change in uh, CIP law to yeah. accommodate very high pressure loads through high performance steel proof three and a half inch and three inch magnum guns, mm. then we're going to have a limit. Yes. Um, and I can't see that change coming in the immediate future. No, it's one of the things we have to address over the next four years. Yeah, sure. Um, is, is CIP pressure limits um, so that commercial cartridge manufacturers can produce loads that really do get the best out of steel shot. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable that, you know, a 36 gram three that I choose to shoot on the foreshore mm. will kill anything that is within my re range yes. of, of humane, you know, ability. Yes. Uh, anything beyond that is you know, my my skill falls off before that cartridge falls off. Sure, and I'm well aware of it. So that 36 gram three, the problem is 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 absolutely fine for what I want to do. The problem with that is the the high density polyethylene wad that comes with it. Yeah, I mean obviously we're chucking these things out on the foreshore, and they're very very difficult to pick up. And do you know what I'm going to be? And it's going to sound That's really totally rude. Different no, 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 no. Yeah. This is the trouble. Um, you're really interesting. You're great fun. You're you're, you're mesmerising. I mean, you're clearly. Um, you know, au fait and, and understanding of many different facets. Well, generally, certainly within, you know, the shooting I fraternity. I bore, bore on this subject forever. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fabulous. And do you know what? The fear is that we're going to run into... Fair enough. Yep. Uh, and I say a fear because um, what I'm basically saying is um, I want you to come back. Okay. Yeah. And we can talk about some different subjects. Yeah. Um, this has been fabulous. And what I'm going to take from today, um, which I think is quite wonderful, and by sheer coincidence... Um, something that I and we do here at Hound Hall mm. is, and it sounds a, a bit sort of obvious, but he's getting the best out of people. Yeah. Getting people to do the best that they can do. Yeah. Be it the thing on the end of the muzzle, be it the patch over the eye, whatever. Take them to the point and then let them grow. Yeah. And let them find their own wonder and their own magic and their own zone or zen Absolutely. space. Yeah. And I think that's what I'm going to take from there. That's, 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 that's been the real sort of clincher. Yeah, I think that's um, one of the things that's most important with people as they go through their shooting careers is to find their next level. Yeah. Find the level that they want. The, the next stage in their journey. Asking yeah. the next question. So if you just want to shoot you know, standard clays, or if you just want to shoot very average pheasants and partridges, that's fine. Yep. But if you want to progress, you need to have it within yourself to ask questions of yourself and mm. find out from people who know the answers. Well, I find I, your mentor. I think we can do a part two on that, and I think we'll punt out some, okay. you know, some 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 sort of questions to listeners and see if they can come back in with with points that they want to pick up on or that might help them. Yeah, that would get us to do a a part two to this sure and uh, maybe we can do pigeon part three and shot and so on and so forth yeah in fact i can find you a room to rent <laughs> if you want you can save the volvo and it'll only be 10 minutes oh, and not 40 no, minutes homeschooling away. kids tomorrow i can't <laughs> stay i'm afraid so and much as i'd like to um but no i can't get out of homeschooling tomorrow but can i say simon <laughs> reinhold who's also uh you've got a beautiful website thank you um you're also on instagram yeah what's the tag for that uh si it's underscore simon reinhold Perfect. And the website... .co.uk, sorry. SimonReinhold.co.uk. Perfect. And the website... Is SimonReinhold.co.uk. Exactly it's got, the it's same. Subtitle nice is the, the Art of Game Shooting. Just like his, his teaching method, fluid and free. Wonderful. Thank Can you. I say, Simon, thank you very much indeed for today. My pleasure. I know it wasn't a five-minute journey. Sorry. Um, thank you for your commitment. Really interesting. And we we'll look forward to seeing yeah. you again soon, yeah? Yeah. Look God bless. Thank you.